Hello and welcome everyone to a new episode here on the War of Rebellion podcast for H so War. I'm your host Niels Eichhorn and today we are again going very global. So from Austria, I am today talking to Tom Larkin who is I have to look this up again. He is a faculty member assistant professor there we go at the university of prince edward island in canada if you don't know where that is it is just above nova scotia and connected to mainland canada through confederation bridge which i find very interesting considering canada's <laughs> history um, tom has himself a long journey behind him considering he got his PhD at the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom, MA from the from York University, and now it gets really fun. The book we're going to talk about today is his new book, The China Firm, American Elites and the Making of British Columbia, published by Columbia University Press. Press, and I think I just said British Columbia Society instead of Colonial Society. <laughs> there we go. Too much C's there. Um, came out in March of this year, 2024. And we are going to talk with him about that new book and Americans in the British trade port of Hong Kong during the middle decades of the 19th century. So, Tom, so great to see you. First time I have a five-hour time difference person on the chat. <laughs> Thank you for the invite and for, uh, for accommodating the time difference as well. I'm sure it's quite late for you now. Nah, like West Coast is really hard. East yeah, Coast is imagine. easy. <laughs> East Coast is easy. And you're not in Hong Kong. That's even easier, Zen. Even easier. <laughs> So tell me, how did you, considering you're Canadian, we talked before, you're a Canadian from Toronto, you go to college in the UK, and you write about Hong Kong, Americans in Hong Kong. How do you come to that? So the, the path follows the um, sort of the route of the scholars that I wanted to work with. So I, I started at York University uh, back in, I don't know, 2010, maybe. Um, and York had a, a fairly strong contingent of scholars working on East Asia. Um, and as an undergrad, sort of that seemed like something really interesting that I wanted to dig more into. I enjoyed those courses. Um, I got really sort of inspired by them. Uh, stayed on at that school to do my master's with, um, you know, Joan Judge, who's a sinologist, and she really pushed me into sort of working on Shanghai, which I found very uh, sort of illuminating and uh, great as a topic. And then when I sort of decided I wanted to do my PhD, I started searching around for, uh, you know, historians of Shanghai that would be good to work with. So I was really thinking about um, an advisor that might, you know, really sort of cultivate that interest and provide good feedback. And the person at the time to do this with was Robert Bickers at Bristol. Um, so it was less a decision for Bristol and more a decision <laughs> for Bickers. Um, and I got there and, uh, or I got accepted for the PhD program. And then it's sort of the UK, as you might know, is not a funded PhD journey right off the bat. So I needed to figure out funding. Uh, and my topic broadly was going to look at foreigners. I was originally going to look at sort of the foreign underclass, these people that sort of end up in these imperial port cities, uh, but aren't well off um, and really sort of are a drain on sort of the prestige of colonialism or the imagined prestige of colonialism. And so that was the plan. Uh, but then this uh, opportunity came up a funded opportunity to work specifically on Americans uh, by uh, actually a distant descendant of the Heard family. Um, and so he had put forward this pot of money uh, and he had been very sort of generous in saying that he didn't expect us to write or me rather, or whoever took the, the, um, the opportunity to write specifically about the Herds. He realized that that might be too narrow a focus, uh, but I do micro history as my, my basis. And so I found, you know, it's an actually really great archive and really great narrative to pin this story that I wanted to tell to it. Uh, and so I was still able to look at things like class and race, but it, it, instead of looking from the bottom up, it's a much, uh, it's a top down history of it um, in many ways. Um, but that story sort of directed me naturally more towards Hong Kong than towards Shanghai. Um, 
I was also shaped by my cohort. So when I started at Bristol, we had what was then called the Hong Kong History Project. So a really healthy contingent of other PhD scholars that were working, or students rather, uh, that were working on Hong Kong. Um, some really great scholars in that group, such as Vivian Kong and Catherine Chan and Kate and Lee. Um, and so we sort of all came up together working on Hong Kong. And then when I stayed on with Bristol, they were just launching the Hong Kong History Center, which is the first dedicated history center of the city um, globally. Um, and so that was really taking off. And so I just continued working on Hong Kong through that. Um, but so it was really the path I followed was through the influence of the scholars I wanted to work with less than the school I wanted to be at. Um, and that's really what took us to Bristol in the first place. It, it sort of eliminates the other questions that I had of like, why is he hurt family? And you kind of already <laughs> answered that now. Of like, um, yeah, but were... I guess there's worse things of how to get stuck with a family. There definitely are. Um, and also I was allowed to be sort of as critical as I wanted to be of this family and mm. to sort of do what I would with them. Uh, the the man that sort of put up the, the studentship he just wanted a history of Americans and he's a very sort of uh, rational and reasonable um, sort of patron in a way. Uh, and so he gave sort of free reign to do what you want. So it's not like one of these family histories where they expect a certain narrative to be put out. He just wanted this story told, however it might appear. Kind of not the typical 19th century Hagar, and what is it, Hagography, where you kind of like have yeah. like laud and love in presenting the greatest ways possible the character of the of that biography. Um, Precisely, yeah, and yeah, uh, in a way, it's, I mean, it's their flaws that make them interesting. Um, yeah, of course. Thing, so, but um, so you already mentioned that. So, did you find like for the hurt family that that families still have like resources and documents or did you have to kind of look how other people talk about some no so it's um frankly there's too much <laughs> to, to work with um which is a, that's a, not a, often the historian saying that not often no um so it, to hedge this i'm not a business historian but this is a history about a, a merchant family um, I do social and cultural history. And so I'm really interested in the way that people write to each other, talk to each other, the things they talk about. Uh, and the herds were great because it's a business, but it's a business that's run by a family. So it's like, in a way, a little bit nepotistic. Um, but because of this, the business records are also deeply intimate. So they talk about you know, a whole range of things in there, but they wrote prodigiously uh, to each other. So basically every mail service, which was every two weeks, they would fire off, you know, another sort of you know letter barrage. Box, a barrage of letters to each other okay. um, and so but they would also receive letters and so you're tracking these conversations that are taking like place over the space of six months but they're like it's a very vibrant conversation and like each letter is like eight pages long it's full of sort of you know commercial information but social information who's who who's doing what um you know so they're they're really incredible resources and then the company also, because it went bankrupt um, quite mm -hmm. spectacularly, they have all of their financial records available uh, because those were all the matter of legal scrutiny. Uh, there's also a huge holding of herd stuff in the Jardine Matheson archive in Cambridge mm -hmm. uh, because Jardine Matheson uh, sort of adjudicated the bankruptcy. Um, oh, yeah, so, British rule, right. Yeah. Um, but then also because they're socialites, they appear all over the place in sort of public records as well. Like you see them in, you know, China Punch, you see them in China Mail, uh, you see them in the letters of other Americans that are out there um, yeah. who are sort of commenting on all the stupid things that Albert Heard did one day, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so like they're, they're public figures in a way, and that really lends itself to how much they appear in the archive. Right. No, that's, that's incredible. And like, I mean, that's, it's nice when you have to like four or five big repositories where you can go and you find most of the information and then, yeah, you can find more in like smaller places, but you have the bulk of the work done in one or in like a handful of locations. That's makes life a lot easier as a researcher. It does. Uh, <laughs> I will say very briefly that I was like, I was very excited to be doing all of this work in Hong Kong, which is a city that I deeply okay. love. Uh, and then it turned out that all of my uh, archives were in Harvard. Uh, so I spent a lot of winters <laughs> freezing as I walked across the Charles River, not in Hong Kong. Uh, <laughs> but 
It and you were a poor grad student, so you really felt like Housie Hearts felt after their bankruptcy bad embossed uh, and kind of <laughs> you could put yourself really into that. Yeah, but yeah, it, it, right. It's sort of like, oh, I'm looking forward to study the place where and then you kind of end up with like, oh, no, I have to go somewhere completely different to yeah. to do this research. <laughs> Yeah, which I, I mean, yeah, in a way it did help with the final chapter of the book, which is sort of a um, yeah, it was almost a very to uh, to be in Boston and to sort of see what their lives looked like afterwards. Like it, a lot of it's based off of me actually being there and walking the streets that they were on and mm -hmm. sort of staying around where they stayed. No, I, I very much enjoyed that. It was it was almost another book that you had back there in that last chapter. That was just so so much going on. <laughs> after their china like there's a whole nother dissertation in there like what what do you do after china <laughs> yeah um, well and in maybe the the sort of the, the worst way of this being a, a dissertation project that gets revised into a book that chapter was very much one that got added oh sort of posthumously <laughs> but it oh, was well. fun to write oh, i guess the uh the press does have sort of desires of what they like to see at the end well and it was um, one that i wanted to write too because i think yeah when i did this original project the story ended sort of with the herd's bankruptcy but that isn't the end of the story as no, that chapter it's not. i mean china remains so relevant to these people once they mm -hmm. go back to the united states whether they go through a bankruptcy like the herds yeah. or whether they're more successful like the forbes family or the russells or the sturgis is yeah. i mean it's I think it's a point that we need to look at more when we do global history is the ways that places have permanence in people's lives mm -hmm. and their memories and their experiences. No, I mean, that's like where you say that that's exactly the point I make in my first book, right? Like you study these 1848 ers you can't study them fresh off the book in the United States. They, they have mm -hmm. all this ideological baggage that they're bringing and some of them takes that log then additional baggage somewhere else and like that's the same with like merchants right they make Absolutely. all these connections in one place and then they use those connections somewhere else to be successful it's, it's yeah, no, crucial it's, it's definitely it's part of the narrative for sure um yeah. and one that people hopefully will start doing more of uh, but we've seen like some really good global histories really start to engage with the long-term narratives yeah that like micro is good, but we also need macro. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to ask the other thing, because you already brought Hong Kong up too, and you, you explained it well, but I'll let you do it again here too, of like, what about Chinese sources? What about like material related to Hong Kong, to like China during this period? How much... How much do you have? How much did you find? What were sort of your decisions with regard to that material? So this is, I mean, crucially, uh, I mean, because it's a top-down history and because we can't do everything, there is a certain amount of archival erasure that's going to occur. I mean, I'm working predominantly with colonial archives, um, mm -hmm. and I'm going to call the herds a colonial archive because it is, yeah, frankly. Right. Um, and because of this, there's a certain way that uh, information is privileged, preserved, saved. There's a certain way that different communities are talked about or the ways their voices appear. And I mean, the herds weren't necessarily interested in preserving the records that were sent to them by their Chinese you know, wards or their Chinese customers or partners. Uh, we do have a bit of that in their archive and there are some Chinese language sources, especially around their commodore, Bok Se Young, um, who has quite a successful life. Um, but, it's I, like, proportionately, there's not a lot of Chinese uh, work to go through there. And then the other bit that was really a struggle, and I tried to sort of work against the archive in this, is that the most common interactions that the herds had with the Chinese society that they were embedded in was with their, you know, their servants, their employees mm -hmm. the, that they worked with. And these are, you know, perspectives that are historically just not privileged. Um, they're not mm -hmm. kept, they're not preserved. We don't have records on them. I mean, I've done a bit of uh, digital work in this, uh, like network analysis, mm -hmm. and it's almost impossible to analyze these communities even quantitatively because they're only ever really entered in the archive or entered in the record as accounting numbers. Mm -hmm. One year I have 52 servants, the next year I have 54. We can't tell if these are the same people, if they're different people, we can't really tell where they come from. 
we can make assumptions based off of some of the contracts that we have, which I do try to do as much with as I can. Um, but it, like really you're sort of working against, uh, you know, uh, a deer in the archive. And I think there's a scholar, I, I just recently wrote a chapter on this actually, but there's a scholar, uh, Arondikar, who wrote a book called For the Record. And she makes this point that we kind of need to stop privileging this fantasy that we will ever be able to like rescue voices from the archive. Sometimes they are just lost right. and like we need to work with the assumption that there are narratives that don't appear and we need to find new ways of sort of privileging those narratives then. But so there's not a lot that appears directly in the words or in the voices of Chinese agents in mm -hmm. this narrative because there's really not many Chinese agents that are given or able to have a voice in this narrative. Mm -hmm. um, it's also difficult because some of the, the Chinese records that we do have from Hong Kong are difficult records to use in the ways that they talk about American society or the ways that they talk about Britain because they're also typically funded by missionaries. Oh, yeah. And so they tend to be, you know, they are Chinese language, yeah, and they do sort of reach a Chinese community um, and they do mm. provide some subtle critiques of colonial society, but often they're just, you know, translations of the things that missionaries want to teach the Chinese community right. Right. about America. So using Chinese records that sort of are already designed to sort of prove your confirmation bias is also not necessarily <laughs> the most productive thing to do. Um, so yeah. it's, it's tricky um, and it's something I, I really want to address with my next project is to really look at the ways that the Chinese community is begin, beginning to respond to this very explicit American imperialism that they're witnessing. Yeah. Uh, but this just wasn't the right book to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So it is, I, I guess the short is it's coming. It's, it's, it's on the it's horizon. <laughs> no, but it's a, that's a good book too, because I mean, in many ways, um, I let me let me paraphrase like how like when I when I saw your book I was like very excited about it because it was sort of like ooh like I like Duncan Campbell and I just brought out our civil war in the age of nationalism and China's of course in it because you can't get around to Taiping rebellion that just a, absolutely like it's a non-starter in the 19th century you you got to include that but it's so little that we have with regard to China and Chinese interactions with the United States. Like you said, it's the missionaries that are down there and they're having obviously an agenda with regard to converting Chinese people. Like, I mean, that's what um, the leader of the Taiping Rebellion comes into contact with. And then like next time you see China or like first time you see China, see China clippers out of New England and you have this missionary stuff. And then it's like that late 19th century diplomatic history stuff of like the great China market myth. And mm -hmm. there, it just, it, it seems so like, like little that we have. So it was very exciting to kind of see that and kind of like also see the other side, right? Like we always approach diplomatic history through like, Oh, the United States thinks, Oh, China, great big market. We should get involved. And we never hear the Chinese side of, do we actually like the Americans? Do we want to be involved with them and associate? What do we think about them? And yeah, there's some very great work. That's, uh, I mean, I appreciate that you point out that gap because there's some really great work that's starting to come out that's sort of approaching that. But as you mm -hmm. say, it's like, it's the, this whole period between like 19, or 1840 rather, sorry, and 1900 is almost sort of like this black hole of information yeah. about the ways that Americans and Chinese are sort of competing with each other, working together, doing things in China that affect American perceptions. I mean, Dale Norwood came out with a really brilliant book last uh, last year that sort of managed to do this, looking predominantly at uh, the United States itself and the ways that um, they, the U.S. started to form sort of a, a China policy mm -hmm. during the time. But he's sort of, you know, the standout in the field in that regard. And I mean, like, even your Civil War point, like Steve Platt had a book out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that was on the Taiping Rebellion about it. 10 years ago, I say. About 10 years ago now. And his bit on the ways that this uh, interplays with the American Civil War even is like, it's like maybe about four pages long, if that, yeah. Yeah. in the whole book. And it's like, he makes a point that's incredibly important in it. But it's, as you say, it's, there's not a lot going on there. And so we do have some really great, like Steve Platt's work is really helpful in this regard. Um, you know, uh, Conroy uh, Kretz has just put out a missionary diplomacy book as well, which does include you know, China in sort of the late 19th century. So people are starting to pick up these threads yeah. and really work with it. Um, but as you say, it's 
it's not nearly as robust as I think it needs to be, especially right. because it is informal diplomacy. It's merchants, it's missionaries, right. it's private actors directing policy. Yeah. Well, that always was a problem of China really relations with China, right? It was like the US always had that sort of hands off approach of like, when you look at the Germans, the British in the late 19th, early 20th century, like, oh, you want a railroad concession? Government helps you get that. And like, you, you feel threatened by the Chinese? We send troops, right? But the United mm. States just never did that. So it's, it's of course, a very different environment you all of a sudden, you also a uh, operate under in, in that regard. Oh, absolutely. And this is, I think, where trans-imperialism comes in crucially as Americans start to realize that they're not going to get the support that they want. Yeah. So they really start to appeal to their, you know, their British peers, and they start to identify themselves alongside their British peers with the same interests in China. And yeah. you see, uh, you know, constant sort of references to Americans wanting sort of British military might to protect their commercial interests as well. Um, and... It's sort of like in, in some way, when I read your book, it sort of reminded me of the scholarship related to the Monroe Doctrine, right? Of like, Absolutely. Like Monroe puts out this doctrine, but who really enforces it? The British Navy enforces it because the U.S. doesn't have the capability. And it seems like it's the same in China, right? The Americans want to be involved, want to be players in China, but they need the British to kind of open the doors and provide the guns to protect people. And like, like then they're sort of the beneficiaries um, in it all. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I don't know, it, it begs this question as well of sort of the importance of this community in the first place, because they're small. It, it's not a lot of Americans there. And I mean, as Norwood's book sort of shows from the other side of this narrative, they do have a disproportionate effect on American legislation for their size, That's but they are still, I don't know, they're, they don't really represent a majority of American interests. They are this fringe element for a while. Um, I mean, the fact that most of these firms, like the major firms, go bankrupt by the 1880s, and so no one back home, frankly, really cares that much because it doesn't affect their yeah. lives in any yeah. way, shape, or yeah. form. Well, I think that uh, one of the other things that I wanted to talk with you about was sort of like, I, I want to say like, it may have been Dave Pryor and I at, at one of the Schaefer conferences had this like ongoing debate over like two or three conferences where I was like, no, China market, China trade, Japan trade is not really important to the United States. It's like a tiny little thing. Like it may, like a percent maybe of US trade that goes there, maybe half a percent of US trade goes there. But there's this assumption that it's so big and so important. So what's the reality? You you study it. You deal with merchants. Like, what's the reality of like the China trade? Is it really like tiny, or is it and blown out of proportion in the way we kind of think about it? Or what's the reality? I think it it's a hard one to gauge because it has sort of um, it has an ideological importance for missionaries mm -hmm. in the ways that they frame that the like the work that America is doing globally um, really sort of that extension of manifest destiny and this idea mm -hmm. of you know American imperial ascendancy um, and the importance of America civilizing sort of you know I, I'm reading missionary documents right now for another paper I'm writing and like this constant idea that they're picking up the unwashed heaving seething masses of China and like mm -hmm. you know, elevating them. So it has an ideological sort of importance for Americans back home um, that is quite significant. Economically, I mean, you see the capital that comes out of the China trade, maybe not affect the everyday American very much, but it does affect the American internal imperial mission. Okay. So American westward expansion, I mean, railroad magnets like, you know, Forbes uh, make their money selling opium in China. And then they come back and they invest in you know, westward expansion and start speculating in sort of, you know, the Midwest and the uh, Pacific coast. Um, the, the China trade that sort of directly leads to like the trade in indentured servants that directly leads to China's Exclusion Act also really starts to be accelerated through the efforts of these men that are trading in China. So it has this knock on very important effect on sort of, you know, migration history, economic history, colonialism in the United States that is all out of proportion to the size of the community there. Mm -hmm. um, the public as well, the American public really starts to, you know, form these ideas of China and become obsessed with this idea. I mean, like this Orientalist idea of, you know, the quote unquote celestial kingdom. 
Uh, and <laughs> yes. they, they develop yes. this fascination through centenaries. Uh, they develop this fascination through goods that they're encountering. Mm -hmm. In many ways, I, I was talking with my class this year about this because we were looking at the ways that, in many ways, the uh, the China that they're obsessed with is actually a China that's manufactured in Britain and France, uh, <laughs> where Chinese right. merchants right. get really, really good at copying French styles to sell to the American market. So it's like honest chinoiserie that has you know symbols of pastoral French life on it. Um, but they they develop this obsession this commercial obsession uh, especially as consumerism takes hold in the yeah. united states with china as well right. so it exists it looms large in the american imagination um but pragmatically it as you say that the and norwood's book looks at this as well that the, the economics of it aren't that spectacular they're not stunning right. it's not a huge proportion of trade i mean the china trade basically gets battered during the american civil war and mm -hmm. no one notices yeah so no of course so i mean most of most people are aware of like the american civil war being like that u.s part but let's talk about china very briefly of like what's going on in china like in in the years that you study no do you do you mean specifically with the civil war or just in general <laughs> Well, just thinking like in general, like we're we're looking at like roughly the period from like 1840 to like 1880, right? In your book. So what yeah. Hmm? Yeah, so what yeah. so what's going on in China during that those 40, 50 years that you're studying? Oh, far too much. <laughs> yeah, just give me the cliff note, like just kind of a little bit. Yeah, because no. I'm pretty sure there are some listeners who like say know the US history narrative really well, but they don't know much about what's going on in China. Yeah, so we're seeing really um, a, a crisis of sovereignty with the Qing Empire at this time, um, as it sort of comes face to face with the imperial bellicosity of you know Britain, France, Russia, Germany. Um, this begins with the uh, you know really with the illegal sale of opium in the pre-opium war years, of nineteen like the night or eighteen. I'm going to keep saying nineteen, uh, but of the eighteen thirties. Uh, and this ultimately, I mean, China tries to stamp out the trade. They, uh, the emperor sends Lin Zexu down to uh, Guangzhou to uh, basically put a stop to the opium trade. Leads to Britain uh, declaring, this is very much paraphrasing, but leads to Britain declaring war on China. Um, uh, a very quick war. They take Hong Kong as a concession. They open up new treaty ports, establish new trade trades. Um, and this sort of opens the door for other nations to do the same. Uh, and America follows suit. They uh, signed the Treaty of Longxia in 1844, um, which is sort of ironically titled the Treaty of Peace, Amity, and Commerce, uh, in which they establish for themselves most favored nation status. So every other imperialist treaty with China will also apply to the United States, although it will mm. never have to declare war on China to secure that. They also get extraterritoriality enshrined in that. So mm -hmm. they can, in many ways, sort of act with impunity. Um, uh, and they do. Um, so America is empowered by that. And then sort of the subsequent wars that take place, the subsequent treaties that take place uh, really start to give Americans as well the, um, the leg up that they need to continue being competitors in this trade. Yeah. So status quo continues for a while. Nations start to um, you know, expand through the treaty ports. Uh, Shanghai in particular becomes a, a fairly important entrepot. And then in 1856, there's another war with China, uh, the Second Open War, the Arrow War, which is again, sort of hung on a pretext, um, uh, basically a petty argument between British and Chinese officials that gets blown well out of proportion um, uh, and ends up with sort of the wholesale opening of China's interior, many more mm -hmm. treaty ports, many more preferential rights for foreign powers. Um, while all of this is happening, you mentioned the Taiping uh, Civil War. Mm -hmm. so from the 1850s and 18, or through to the 1860s, this is basically this massive uh, conflict that has riven China in two. Um, this man who believes that he is Jesus's younger brother uh, basically establishes a splinter kingdom in the heart of China along the Yangtze River um, and causes absolute havoc. Um, draws many parallels from commenters to the American Civil War in particular. Um, also sort of exposes the willingness of foreigners to, uh, I guess, exploit China as they start to sort of trade mm -hmm. uh, and consider formal recognition uh, of this Taiping uh, Heavenly Kingdom or Taiping Tianguo. Um, so that brings us sort of up to sort of roughly the 1860s. So China's in a, a pretty dire place. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And so what really sort of goes on from this period is coming out of the Taiping Civil War, you have a lot of uh, Chinese reformers, such men such as Zhang Guofan, who start to recognize that the solution to China's problems is possibly a more uh, mediated relationship with the imperialist powers. Uh, and so places like the United States become incredibly important to China as they seek to sort of modernize their, uh, their economy, um, their society, uh, their technology, their education. Um, and so the states in particular, because it's not an overtly imperialist power, because it's sort of managed to hold on to these pretenses of neutrality, becomes one of the prime targets for Zhang Guofan, for uh, another man, Li Hongzhang, uh, to basically learn from the West. So they start to develop a collaborative relationship with the United States. And this is sort of enshrined when they appoint Anson Burlingame as the first Chinese minister and plenipotentiary. Uh, to the United States and Europe. So this is an American man that has now become yeah. the representative for the Qing Empire, um, which is absolutely wild. Um, yeah. And he tends to be, he proves himself to be very progressive and does a, quite a bit for the Qing actually. Um, but so we see America playing this sort of weird, um, you know, teetering position between the imperialist powers and between China through this period. Um, I mean, the, American firms really start to go under following the American Civil War, following sort of the Panic of 1873 as well. Um, so they start to lose sway in China mm -hmm. uh, and the relationship very quickly deteriorates. And as you know, by 1882, we have the Chinese Exclusion Act. We have sort of increasing racism towards China and, uh, in the United States. And so this is really starting to cast that relationship into a poor light. Uh, by the period that my book ends in China is basically on the brink of a Republican revolution. They've had the Boxer Rebellion, which has proved to be sort of incredibly violent, incredibly destabilizing um, right at the end of the, the 19th century. Uh, foreign powers have used this as a pretext to extract yet more concessions from China and the Qing Empire is in crisis. Uh, and pretty soon you're going to have, you know, basically these um, anti-Qing revolutionaries that have you know, studied in America, earned funds in America, are well connected to a global network of Chinese um, sort of uh, influence, effectively topple the Qing in 1911. Um, so America has a role to play in all of this. But what, what we're seeing over this is in Chinese history, it's often called the century of humiliation, uh, where the Qing is just coming to a reckoning that uh, basically foreign powers, the influence of foreign society, is forcing this, uh, the state and uh, the Chinese people to go through these monumental and sometimes very violent uh, changes over this period. Mm -hmm. um, and Americans are present for most of it. <laughs> so, um, so I don't know. That's, yeah, I feel no, like perfect. A lot. <laughs> yeah, perfect. But it kind of gives like a person that is not as familiar with Chinese history, sort of a Cliff Notes version of like what's going on here. Mm -hmm. And, but uh, I mean, I always like Anson and Berlin game because like he was supposed to be in Vienna and the Viennese government said, nope, we, we don't want you. you. You liked the Hungarians a little too much in 1848. And so he, he's a fun character. But now correct me if I'm wrong, but based on when I from a, reading your book, the Americans are kind of the weak power here. They're not the main players but they really benefit from all the things britain does and they exploit that to their benefit right i'm thinking like the guangzhou kind of early stages of the opium war the the brits are kicked out but who stays the americans stay for a little while longer to kind of continue trading so it's like how does the british feel about these americans sort of riding their coattails <laughs> the short answer is not good, um, but it's so Platt's called it a parasitic relationship, and he is absolutely correct in the ways that um, Americans are sort of this parasite on the British imperial project in China. But in many ways, it's also symbiotic. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the British are not happy that the Americans are basically because Americans are also very, like, very explicitly uh, critical of right. the British in, in right. writing. British imperialism. And they adopt this holier than thou attitude towards sort of, you know, what Britain's doing in China. Uh, but the British obviously see through this, they see sort of the, the, the farce of it. And that Americans are, you know, they're also trading in opium, they're also sort of uh, benefiting from the exploitation. So they're, you know, kind of justifiably indignant about the ways that Americans are portraying themselves. Um, 
And that becomes a, a rather sore point. And there's, I mean, throughout the rest of the, the 19th century, as anywhere else in the world, there's going to be these sort of flare-ups of Anglo-American tension um, mm-hmm. around the American Civil War, around like indiscretions uh, over uh, territory rights, fishing rights, uh, the yeah. Alabama yeah. privateering, I mean, whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, they barely ever need an excuse to, to sort of levy critiques at each other. Um, so there's always going to be this sense of national rivalry between the two. Mm-hmm. But when you actually boil it down to the ways that people are getting on on a day-to-day basis, you find that most of this falls away because they are working towards the same goals in China. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, Americans become incredibly important to the British during the first opium war because they have that privileged access preserved to Guangzhou. So they stop, basically, they stop outright trading between America and China, and they start running this route between Hong Kong Harbor and Guangzhou, where they're basically just carrying British goods uh, and then charging a commission on it. Mm-hmm. Um, they're becoming fabulously rich in the process. Uh, like Russell and company does an amazing business during this time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the British kind of, in a way, need the Americans and need their privileged access to function. The Americans need this war between Britain and China for this, you know, this niche mm-hmm. to, to exist. Mm-hmm. And China for its own right is okay kind of watching this happen as long as America doesn't assist the British too much. Right. So they're they're quite wary uh, of keeping America from siding with you know what they view as their legitimate enemies in the British yeah. and the French. Um, so they, they, there's this really sort of uh, tense and sort of calibrated triangular relationship between the three. Um, but on paper, there is a lot of resentment that builds because of this. So, well, yeah, I mean, but I, I kind of I like the sort of notion that you have in the book, right? Of like. There's what's a right for public consumption in the United States, and there's the realities in in Guangzhou, in Hong Kong, of like the close relationship between British and U.S. merchants in these two towns, where it's just like like we're all English speakers, we're all kind of similar, we're all working together, but yeah, publicly we kind of pretend we don't do it. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> It it it's almost like an HOA, right? We're all forced together in this, and we really don't like each other, but we do hang out at the garden parties. <laughs> yeah, no, in many ways, yeah. Um, but it, it's funny because I I don't even think that it's that they don't necessarily like each other. I think they actually probably genuinely do like their British peers and vice yeah. versa. I just think that there's a certain amount of performativity that they have mm-hmm. to go through. Yeah. Um, especially because I mean, life in China is a temporary thing for these men and women. Mm-hmm. So they're going to go back to, you know, New England society. They're going to go back to New York and they're going to have to fit back into this society uh, that expects them to be a certain image of what Americans are. And so these letters are a way of them sort of keeping that performance alive, Mm -hmm. uh, really preserving that place back home. Uh, There's a, a quote I absolutely love by uh, Helen Beale, one of the, uh, the two Beale sisters that ends up in Shanghai. Uh, and she sort of writes uh, at the end of a letter uh, where she's been talking about all the wonderful balls and parties of a, a week at the races. She writes, you must not fear that your daughter is growing anti-American. I'm like a proud Yankee at heart or something to that effect. Uh, so she's <laughs> she's assuring people back home that she is still you know, a patriotic American. Yes, I, I enjoy all these British social activities, but I, I, I'm hating them deep down. Yeah, inside, inside. <laughs> yes. Uh, good gosh. But uh, that's, I guess, a good lead over to like what, what the heart of your book is, which is social life in Hong Kong and the British and U.S. interactions in, in Hong Kong, right? That's that's sort of the heart of the matter, what you kind of said was sort of the social, social cultural aspect of, of your study. So... Like I think today everyone has an image of huge skyscrapers, a bay, Disneyland, a <laughs> massive airport, congestion. Like what but what was Hong Kong like in the eighteen forties, fifties? Uh so in, in the eighteen forties in particular, it was uh, it was a slow start. Um it's I mean it 
in Chinese history, it's a bit of a complex one because it's always been uh, this sort of fringe element to the Qing Empire. It's sort of mm-hmm. been, you know, at various times, a home for smugglers, a home for fishing communities, transient communities, uh, farming communities. It's like it's ha- it has well over six thousand years of you know habit- inhabited history. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's this myth that the the sort of the place becomes something through British ingenuity and British engineering, and you know the city of Victoria appears in 1842 and becomes this global uh you know metropole uh to be, mm. be rival yeah, this not... sort of you know self-made mm. heavy quotes for for listeners uh hong kong mm-hmm. um but the society they go into is one that is conspicuously foreign but in reality not very foreign so i mean when you pull up the census numbers there's for you know the handful of thousands of foreigners that grow in Hong Kong, like into the 1860s, there's you know tens of thousands, up to 100,000 you know Chinese inhabitants in this port, mm-hmm. um, and so Americans are navigating a very narrowly sort of elite foreign society that is sort of uh, surrounded on all levels, uh, infused with Chinese influences, mm-hmm. and this is all maintained through a very sort of strict adherence to socio. Uh, social well socio-political hierarchies really um mm-hmm. socio-racial hierarchies uh so it's it's a stratified society it's a fairly segregated society in theory not in practice because it's impossible to actually enforce that segregation um but it's one in which you have this sort of colonial elite emerge that is really sort of dictating the flow of the way things go for, mm-hmm. for a very long time for the americans in particular it is a, a pretty consciously elite society because coming out to the United or to China from the United States at this time is an act of privilege. Uh, right. So yeah. it's tend to be fairly, fairly well off when they arrive there. Uh, although Island Scully has sort of focused on the underclass that also appears, especially of American prostitutes uh, that develop around sort of the Wan Chai neighborhood. Um, but it's, it's a bit of a fringe society for a while. It's a bit of a colonial frontier for a while. Um, it's got the sort of heart of Victoria uh, which is where most of foreign life takes place. And then as you go out into the um, sort of the, the fringes of it, it becomes more and more Chinese uh, into Taiping Shan or uh, further sort of east uh, around what is now Wan Chai. Um, and it kind of looks like what you would expect of most sort of frontier societies. So, you know, people, you know, they go visiting, they host each other for dinners, they engage in sort of all the, the things to alleviate sort of imperial boredom, if that is really a thing where they play cricket, they you know play tennis, they go riding, they walk along the praia, they're seen. Mm. Um, it's, in a way, it is kind of a boring place. It's a very habitual place, um, but they, they fit into it quite well. Um, it's very colonial. It appears very colonial. There's countless travel records of arriving in Hong Kong and seeing this brilliant facade of, you know, colonial edifices fronting the harbor, the lights sort of like twinkling up into the hills. Um, it's considered a fairly beautiful place. Um, it's also, this is one that I'm just fascinated in is it's not particularly vegetated at this time. So we also think of Hong Kong yeah. as a very forested island. Um, but that is something that actually took place over time is, you know, the, the settling community, the colonizing community planted trees. Oh. Um, so it's, it's a fairly, it is in a way kind of a barren place. It's kind of harsh. Um, malaria is rampant. Uh, although at the time they believe it's bad maize most coming out of happy Valley, which is not so <laughs> happy at this time, um, which is just, you know, mosquitoes. Um, so it, it can be a bit of a harsh place to live as well um, for people that are not constitutionally adapted to it. Right. Um, but it grows fairly quickly. Um, it grows into sort of this fairly privileged place. Um, and it becomes sort of, if not the commercial uh, linchpin, the sort of spiritual linchpin of foreign society in China. Cool. Um, like Hong Kong is really the, the center of elite foreign society. Yeah. No, one thing that that did strike me a little bit here is that you already mentioned it a few times that this is a transient community. Mm-hmm. No one thinks of staying there. Like they they built their 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 houses, they built their businesses, but they're all like thinking like it's only going to be a few years and then I move on. So it's like, why why don't you want to stay in Hong Kong? Like today, people kill to stay in Hong Kong because it's like it's it's such a vibrant community but uh but it it didn't like 
like did they all like just love to be home was it that hong kong just like all the environmental factors were like they just is it sort of like this attitude of like the conquistador like uh, i'll go over to the americas for two years get rich come home and be a rich man what what was it I mean, it's very much, I think, that attitude. It, it comes down to a couple of things. So the first would be, I mean, the purpose of going out to Hong Kong is to earn a competency. And Robert Bickers is going to kill me if I don't define that because he, he loves me to do. Uh, but a competency is basically just a, like a pension, essentially, like your retirement fund. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is to go to Hong Kong and build a competency. That's the, the, the phrase on everyone's lips. So okay. in four years, you should make enough money to retire back in America in fashion. And if you don't, you're kind of an idiot is sort of the, the oh. idea. I, I mean, you see they, like, that's I, failure right there. Like. That is failure right there. But it's it's one of these things that it becomes written about in the China Mail sort of ad in Aussie. These, you know, these foolish clerks who come and they whittle away all their money on drink. And mm -hmm. in, at the end of four years, they have nothing to show for themselves. Mm -hmm. So there is actually like a culture around it. Um, right. But so you're supposed to go back to America and you're supposed to retire on this by like the age of 30. You're supposed to have enough to live out the rest of your life, which when lifespans are like 62, fine. Sure. <laughs> but um, it's also partly because many of these uh, Americans are coming from Knickerbocker or Brahmin society, right? Yeah. So uh, the, the conspicuous pursuit of capital gain isn't fashionable. So you right. want to be a 30 year old socialite. You want to be like a man of letters, yeah. a man of culture. Yeah. So you've got to go make money as fast as possible. So that's part of it. The other side of it is this colonial sort of idea, this colonial myth, which is, you know, partly true, but also partly fabricated about the sort of the inherent evils or dangers of, uh, you know, places in what would be considered the global South at that time. So mm -hmm. uh, going to Hong Kong is in many ways uh, taking a serious risk, betting your health against your financial uh, ability. Uh, the idea that you'll die in Hong Kong is embedded in people's minds. If you stay too long, it'll ruin your health. You'll get gout, you'll uh, you know, develop a drinking addiction. The, like, it's that in Boston too. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it all exists in Boston, but yeah. it's almost guaranteed in Hong Kong. And so there's almost a monomaniacal obsession with health. And um, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the Heard brothers, their uncle writes them numerous letters critiquing them for spending too long in China and risking their health when they could have come home had they been sort of more frugal and reasonable. <laughs> um, but it's this idea that colonial societies are inherently unsuited to a white constitution that right, right. is widely subscribed to um, across sort of the British Empire. Yeah, um, well, it comes that white racism that you kind of have there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it definitely pulls into this idea. Um, and so yeah. Hong Kong is just, it's not, most of Asia isn't considered a desirable place to stay for too long. Um, you're really not supposed to do it if you can avoid it. Right. Now, you also mentioned that in the book a few times that like European women are just almost absent in, in the society here in Hong Kong and that when there are a few that they have like these enormous social pressures of like, they have to host and they have to be available and be around and like what it, it is more work almost than what they would have in, in, in Boston or in London or in Bristol, because there's one of very few. So how, how does this lack of women, like I, I, I kind of, very proud of how I phrased that in the questions that I sent you, there's this lifestyle of a, this lifestyle in a bachelor heavy women-less society how does that kind of shape people it so it changes over time because women do uh they do become a larger presence in hong kong and in shanghai and in the other well not most of the other treaty ports but some of the major treaty ports um into sort of the late 19th century mm -hmm. but in the early years as you say it's entirely sort of this masculine space um i mean even your servants like your, your personal house servants tend to be men um, and it leads to sort of, in a way, this real camaraderie between people. There's, uh, especially in these early years, a lot of sort of like uh, intermixing cross-national uh, friendships form uh, because you're all sort of men in this space doing the same thing at the same time. Right. One of the interesting effects that women have as they come into this space is they actually sort of affect a retreat from this internationalism of society oh. because it becomes easier to sustain uh, sort of the society that you're used to at home oh, yeah. so 
Heard, uh, Albert Heard, when his, um, you know, when his wife joins him, uh, Livingston, they spend most of their time going to dinners and spending, uh, you know, evenings out with mm. the Forbes's um, and, you know, the Forbes women uh, sort yeah. of at Rose Hill in Hong Kong because they're able to, they no longer necessarily have to interact. Uh, so on a, on a private level, life becomes a bit more reclusively American because they're able to sort of recreate some semblance yeah. of American society back home. Um, but it does really, it affects the ways that men behave. It affects the relationships that develop. Um, I mean, as you sort of noted, there's a very limited number of women there. Their attentions are sought out sort of religiously. They, most of them are familiar with what it means to sort of be a woman in society and sort of the social pressures that are expected uh, or put on you. Uh, and they're comfortable with navigating these spaces, but almost all of them, when they arrive in Hong Kong or Shanghai, basically right at being run off their feet um, by, by the attention that's being given to them. Um, and some manage it quite well. Ruth Bradford sort of just, you know, makes an absolute mockery of everyone that tries to, to befriend her. Um, <laughs> but others, uh, others sort of struggle with it. Um, and so they become sort of incredibly important to the way that society functions because they become this sort of anchor that, uh, you know, um, that social life revolves around in many ways. Um, so they're important in that regard. There's also this idea that, uh, I mean, they are usually typically very elite because it's, it's expensive to have a wife out in Hong Kong well, yeah. uh, and women are a liability to the colonial authorities. So if, mm -hmm. if I brought my wife out to Hong Kong with me and I was a merchant and I passed away because of malaria or something, the colonial authorities would be duty bound to put up that uh, that woman for the time being, and then to repatriate her at their right. expense, yeah. and or the at the firm's expense. Um, right. And so, firms really discourage, uh, especially lower level clerks, bringing mm -hmm. their wives with them because it's uh, it's a financial liability. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's almost a privilege to to have a family at this time in this space. Yeah. I was Which, just thinking as you were talking because where you said a sort of liability, we do have the Taiping Rebellion, obviously, which has like it, it doesn't touch on the main areas where you have Europeans, like it, it threatens Shanghai a little bit and the European community there goes a little gets a little worried about it. Hmm. But I'm thinking like like the Indian mutiny and the violence per, perpetuated by whatever we want to call the individuals in India rebelling against British rule against women and children from the colonial authorities. Does that have any impact that you kind of saw that there's sort of a worry too of having women in, in China because of like the instability politically and militarily that is being seen, especially right late fifties, early sixties. So it, it does, but it's almost entirely irrational. Um, well, of course it is. <laughs> well, and this is I, well, this is a, a, a point that um, you know Harold Fisher Tina and Noel Etherington have made uh, quite a bit about the idea of colonial panic. Is mm -hmm. the, uh, what happens in India in 1857 really sort of sparks a, a domino effect of people freaking out about you know um, the danger of indigenous populations and mm -hmm. what they might pose to you know respectable foreign women. Right. Um, yeah. And so there is very much like a, a fear, really, um, like a, a fear of like the the libidity of natives or the, um, the, the potential violence of natives. Uh, and you do see this come across in women's writing, but it's sort of muted in Hong Kong. For some reason, there's a or China rather. I don't know what it is about China specifically versus India. I, I'm, I haven't done the research myself, and I'm sure that there's more to do on this, but there's a uh, for some reason, the, the racial relationship that develops between white women and their servants or the surrounding Chinese community mm -hmm. is much more patronizing, much more infantilizing of the Chinese than it okay. is of, you know, the, the community in India. Yeah. Uh, and so in a way, I mean, there's a fear of the threat of sort of, you know, having a woman in this space and what that might mean to the prestige or the safety of, you know, white purity mm -hmm. or this idea of white purity. But the women themselves, when they write, are like kind of deeply patronizing about their servants and they don't seem yeah. threatened. In fact, they seem quite cool. sort of dismissive of, you know, either the mental capacities or the, the sexual capacities or the cultural capacities yeah. of the people they employ. Um, and it's it's kind of a weird thing to read in many ways. A bit. How but about yeah. the reverse? Because uh, that was the other part that 
I, I don't like I, I think you hinted at it once or twice in the book. Like, what about the man? Like, like we always we know that in like colonial societies without white women, men in these colonial like merchant or administrators will tend to go and find native women from those societies. Mm. Do we have that here in Hong Kong too? Do some Americans, some British kind of get themselves Chinese wives and they do they just when they pack up and leave for the metro again they just kind of like bye and never see you again uh so we do have this uh appear as a trend but it's it sort of plays out on a very case-by-case -case basis and there's a, a huge amount of granularity to the ways that it functions um so sometimes it's a very uh strategic uh partnership between the two sometimes it's legitimately romantic um mm -hmm. but it has i don't know there's there's different paths that uh sort of you know men in their respective uh protected women is sort of the, the phrase that's banded around mm -hmm. uh, there's different paths that they go so th the herds are a really good example of this because i mean you use the phrase abandoned i know i know you don't mean it sort of um uncritically but it's the there isn't actually that much of a tendency to abandon these women. They're often mm -hmm. left with, um, with stipends, with, uh, you know, a, a way of sustaining themselves, uh, a way of sustaining the children that have been had by them. Um, and this often actually sort of shields them from some of the harsher aspects of life. So the herds, for instance, they go bankrupt, right? Right. Um, and this oh, has yeah. a fairly deleterious effect on their own families. Mm -hmm. But John Hurd, for instance, has a, a son, Richard Howard Hurd, with this woman, Lam Kyu Fong, and Richard Howard Hurd is given this fairly aggressive stipend that he's able to build his life on that is shielded from the bankruptcy because it's, you know, um, unofficial money in a way. It's right. discreet money. Uh, and so through this uh, stipend and through the social connections of his family um, and of his parentage, he's able to sort of really effectively navigate this middle to elite class of Hong Kong and Shanghai society. And he establishes himself as a very leading man in the Eurasian community uh, going forward. So it creates sort of this new realm of opportunity for this interracial sort of uh, community that crops up in its wake. Some of these, uh, you know, children accompany their parents back to um, back to the United States. So uh, Joseph or George Dixwell's uh, kid goes back to Boston where he's enrolled in boarding school. Uh, some of them enter sort of elite Chinese society. So Augustin Hurd's uh, daughter, a woman that's referred to in the record as An Nui, which is certainly not her name. Uh, she sort of becomes part of the, the Guangzhou uh, Chinese elite instead of mm -hmm. joining Hong Kong society. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities. I mean, some do get abandoned for sure, but others are well taken care of. Yeah, uh, these also aren't necessarily always discrete relationships. So they do sometimes right. result in actual fairly explicit marriages, um, although that's often frowned upon. Um, I was going to say. <laughs> it's... But then it's a, it's also sometimes it's a sort of a relationship of convenience as well. So yeah. some of the, the most successful landlords in early colonial Hong Kong are protected mm -hmm. women who are using their stipends to buy property and then rent it out um, and right. they establish themselves quite well. So it's, it's a symbiotic relationship as well in a way that mm -hmm. um, sometimes it can be exploitative, but sometimes it can be genuinely sort of generative for both parties. Uh, right. So. right. Um, and then of course, like I, it it like there there's a whole chapter on like the social activities and it 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 felt so like written when you when you read through that chapter of like oh there's a boating club right of like and, the, <laughs> and her to see what was it the commodore yeah of, of that and it, it 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 so reminds right it's like where you say like this is sort of like their little enclave of like pretending like they're in in the United States or Britain. And it's like it's literally like they they create all these social organizations that they would know from home, and that they're now recreating here in this frontier colonial society. Um, how how important was how important was this for your social standing to be part of these groups and organizations and clubs and. So it was, I mean, it was significant. Uh, it was, I mean, in a place where most commerce was built on interpersonal relations and on sort of, you know, um, you know, backroom handshakes and things like that, it was really important to sort of demonstrate your participation in society, demonstrate your success, your social prestige. Uh, the herds, I, I kind of refer to it a bit in the book as like they buy themselves status in a way by, <laughs> by playing the part. Um, 
And it's, I mean, Americans are doing so very explicitly because they're trying to sort of, in a way, lay claim to their mm-hmm. belonging in this elite society. Yeah. But what's interesting is, I mean, if you go back to that point where most Americans are already fairly elite, I mean, like the Americans coming out to China, they come from societies that already have these sort of uh, systems in place, these um, sporting club cultures, mm-hmm. these, um, you know, social club cultures. Uh, and so Americans aren't unfamiliar with how to do this. Mm-hmm. They're quite you know, socially fluent in that way. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's been quite a bit of work on the British community coming out where they're actually sort of, by virtue of being in Hong Kong, able to start affording activities that they wouldn't have been able to afford back home. Oh, okay. So in a way, the community they're engaging with is actually slightly less fluent in these cultural norms than they are. Mm -hmm. They're sort of, you know, punching up a little bit about their their class weight uh, because they can. Right. It's a lot more class encrusted in Britain where it's like... if you want to be in a like horse racing club, you have to be a certain social standing, which you don't need in Hong Kong because Precisely. you're one of the few white people here. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's weird because Americans are almost overperforming in that sense. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, but they do still have to play by British rules in many ways. Right. Uh, and so the clubs that they take part in, the, the things that they do, do appear in sort of a very mm-hmm. British way. Um mm-hmm. And I mean, these, they're, no matter how large they grow, they still remain a, a pretty stark minority socially. Mm-hmm. Um, and so any of the clubs, any of the committees you see them on, it's usually one or two British or American names in a sea of sort of, you know, Brits or Scots or what have you. Um, well, I mean, it's they, a small group, it, so. It is a small group, yeah. But so they do. The, they do well. mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry. No. It's. It, it's... Like, I mean, it's like today, right? If you're in, in, in your little community that you live, if you have family, it's like you're on the school board or you're on the parent-teacher co- uh, council or you're part of this club or that club. And it, it's the same people over and over that you see on those. And then you have the others who are like, I don't really want to. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, Absolutely. Right. Um, now, the other kind of where we're kind of talking connections here and it's been a topic that has come up a few times. I, unfortunately, because it's the digital copy I was given, they blurred those pictures out, but you have a large number of these network maps in your book. And I'm kind of curious, like a, how, how difficult was it to kind of develop these kind of like mapping out who are these individuals connected to and how important, like you have, I, I didn't count, but I think it was like 20 of those in there. So why did you want to include all of those kind of connections, kind of showcase how how the herds built all these relationships? What what made that so important? So it was a it was a bit of a matter of necessity, I felt. Um and as a quick digression, I will say that your digital copy is on the money. One of the I, I loved working with Columbia University Press. I thought they did a great job with everything. My editors were great, but my one critique is that they washed out the images in all of the copies of the book. Oh, so oh they oh. are very hard to read. So <laughs> you're not alone, I think. Okay. Uh, but anyway. Um but yeah, so I started doing it um, because I was really trying to get a sense of the ways that the herds were leveraging their travels to embed themselves in this global community of like transnational elites, really, or trans imperial elites, right? And I was kind of struggling for a way to do it. And I started doing it as a a practice, really, for myself to get a sense of who they were connecting with and what Mm -hmm. their social networks were looking like. Uh, And then it kind of ballooned into this thing that actually became sort of analytically significant. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I will say, I mean, this isn't the most uh, sophisticated network analysis you'll ever see. I haven't weighted my connections. I like I used a very sort of basic um, analytical method to sort of pull them together. My entire methodology really, and this is going to sound like I'm dragging my own book for a second, but it, it is one thing that I do regret a little bit here is not putting more time into this. But I basically, anytime a herd mentioned being in the same place as someone else uh, in any of their records, I mm-hmm. logged that person and I built a connection between the two of them. Okay. Um, and so I just did this for every name that popped up. Um, and so there's a lot of very superficial connections in this network. 
Uh, but so I tried to use it really at, at a baseline as an illustrative way or an mm -hmm. illustrative sort of demonstration of the ways that they were connected to British communities, the ways that they were connected to mercantile communities that were mostly mm -hmm. American, the ways that Chinese people didn't really appear in their records, um, uh, as a way of sort of really getting a sense of what their network looked like. Mm -hmm. But then the reason um, that I hedge it with such a qualitative reading in that chapter is because the way that I constructed this network analysis doesn't actually tell you who's you know, historically significant to the herds mm. or who's significant in terms of a network to the herds. I mean, there's some really incredibly big names in that, uh, in that network um, that mean, you know, relatively nothing in the grand scheme of the herds mm. sort of day-to-day -day right. life. Right. So I tried to sort of privilege the ways that the herds uh, appeared in their networks, the types of people they tried to connect with, the types of relationships mm -hmm. that they sought out. But at the end of the day, a qualitative reading of these records was actually necessary to determine what they were doing with these networks, how they were leveraging them. Yeah. But the point that I wanted to get across is that in going to China, they networked constantly. They communicated with as many people as possible. They kind of collected people in a way um, as, as a matter of pride. And then there were sort, uh, sort of certain members within this network that they then rely upon constantly in China, but also leaving China. Mm -hmm. um, and so this network is really just a way of weaving them into this global world, this, mm -hmm. this idea that you can take a, a history of you know, four men, really, and blow it up to understand the ways that they are part of a society, that they help facilitate society or made by that society. Right. And I, I, I'm, I want to go back to the maps in a minute that you also have in there, but Let's first talk about like why do they fail? Like why does their business like and these networks that they create all of a sudden just doesn't do it anymore? There's a there's numerous numerous reasons for this. Um, I'm going to be a bit facetious and say my my personal opinion, and then I'll go with what the book says. But my personal <laughs> opinion is that they fail because Albert Heard is pretty garbage at managing business. <laughs> Yeah, you can't say that in the book. <laughs> yeah. But he's uh, he's basically, he's this man that comes out. He's the third brother. Um, and mm -hmm. he's never wanted to be a businessman from the get-go. He's sort of seen himself as a man of letters. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he, comes, he spends most of his time in China playing diplomat, oh, uh, really focusing on building up his sort of social persona, his social profile, his political profile. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it genuinely works to the detriment of the firm because one he makes himself slightly obnoxious in society so other americans write about the pretensions of albert heard at it again schmoozing um but then it also i mean he spends a lot of money doing this and it drains uh, his attentions away from operating the business properly mm -hmm. so i mean the firm falls apart under his guidance frankly um and so i do think he's a big part of it but also like from from a very sort of global perspective in, in a way that's completely outside the hand of the herds, the American civil war kind of happens at a time that's really disadvantageous for most Americans. So yeah. it occurs basically right when the Yangtze has been opened, Americans mm -hmm. are they're really anticipating this opening. And so they, right. they throw New York's dockyards into overdrive ordering ships for the United, mm -hmm. States, the United States. And all uh, those ships now go to the US Navy instead of to the China trade. Pretty much exclusively. Uh, yeah. And by the time they do reach China by 1865, 1866, that market has been saturated. Britain's yeah. already sort of taken the lion's share of it. The Chinese merchants as well have uh, become yeah. sort of, you know, a key player in this. Um, and so Americans, they invest all this money and then that money has nowhere to go. And they're right. unable to offload these ships as well because there's too many already. Japan, which is one of the markets they'd hope to sell it for, has already had its own disastrous civil war. Yeah. Um, right. So they don't know what to do with these boats. And yeah. it's All sort of, of yeah. yeah. It's it goes against one of the sage warnings that Augustine heard the senior uh sort of you know tells to his nephews and to uh, Dixwell and Coolidge right off the bet, like off the off the get-go is he basically like cautions against property ownership about having capital weighed down in boats mm. and property. Um, and he sort of right. emphasizes the importance of agility and then almost to a T everyone that follows him ignores his advice and it comes and disaster to disaster strikes. <laughs> um, 
but the herds aren't alone in this. So all the other firms struggle because of it. And then mm -hmm. the market oversaturates more agile uh, sort of firms that basically just operate as brokers start to, to mm -hmm. fill up the, uh, the gaps. And then the panic of 1873 hits and Americans that are already reeling are basically just completely left out to dry. Yeah. Um, and I mean, Norwood sort of makes the point in his book, because he actually provides the graphs to back all this up, that the percentage of China trade doesn't drop significantly at this time. We don't actually necessarily see it collapse, but we don't see it grow in a period where all other streams of revenue are growing. So what we can determine from that is that it's becoming an increasingly marginal part of the U.S. economy. Right. Um, and these firms are really struggling to sort of keep afloat in that environment. Um, right, right. So the herds really, I don't know, they, they just blew it. <laughs> yeah, they blew it. Right. Yeah, but it... so did everyone. I right. Mean, just, they're the first. In a way. Well, I, I guess it's sort of like, you know, it's you 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 started as a broker and you wanted to be bigger, but you, you became bigger at the worst point in time. And what you should have done is just stay broker and kind of um, sit it out. But you never know that what what's going to happen around the corner. Right. Like when you order the ships, you didn't anticipate that the market is going to drop in the United States and civil war breaks out. And Absolutely. Um, you know, it's like the person that buys an electric vehicle and then the oil price goes down and it's like, well, well yeah. now it's. No, it's, and yeah, they, they really, they, I don't think they anticipate the competition from, uh, you know, other Americans. I don't think they anticipate the competition from the British. I mean, Swire mm -hmm. basically just dances around her and absorbs all of its wreckage. Yeah, um, and then becomes you know, it's still around. It's fabulously successful. So does Jardine Matheson, uh, and they also they, there's a, a bit of an arrogance to foreign trade. They don't anticipate Chinese competition. They don't think right. that the Chinese are ever going to beat them at the steam shipping game. But the Chinese are able to offer lower rates, operate yeah. cheaper ships, you know, home field advantage as well. Like it's yeah, yeah, like, so. exactly. <laughs> um, no. Towards sort of the final point, then you also have five maps with sort of what the herds do after China. And what really struck me was that, yes, they go back to, to New England, of course. Like they, they want to re embed themselves into Boston, Boston area society. But they also spend a lot of time in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that struck me as like, how sad like and you kind of explain in part with sort of the connections that they're making as well it's this is something that I, I would love to do more work on and right now i think i've only actually found one book that kind of does touch upon this trend but there's a a weird relationship between new englanders and france that mm. really starts to take hold in this period and i mean like i i'm just working with uh the letters of one of the the daughters of august or yeah august and her the younger right now and they're all in French um, mm. because that's her preferred method of communication. Oh, wow. Um, but a lot of elite New Englanders speak French. They spend a lot of time in Paris. Um, I mean, when Joseph Coolidge's wife is writing to her kids in like into the 1870s and 80s, she's talking about how, you know, it's summertime. So America is awash with, or sorry, Paris is awash with Americans. And like, she's talking about trying to avoid all of her friends that she doesn't want to see. Um, but, but so there's, yeah. there's like a, a strong connection there and I don't have a, a really valid reason for it other than I guess they just like it. Um, yeah. But there is, sure. at least for the herds, there's um, a pragmatic reason why Paris becomes so important. Mm -hmm. and it's because Bering Brothers, based out of London, mm -hmm. is prime financier for most American firms. It's headed by a man, Russell Sturgis, who is uh, an American himself, so he's already sympathetic to American commerce. And so all credit is drawn and uh, returned to Bering Brothers. So if you're traveling to China, you have to make an obligatory stop through Bering on the way. So okay. Americans go to London. It's also why for most of this century of the China trade, while the Pacific takes off as sort of a transit route, mm -hmm. it still manages to function on sort of a, an Atlantic spectrum. Right. Yeah. Uh, but so Americans going to China, they go to London, they spend their time doing their schmoozing with their banks. They go, they stop in Paris where they, you know, have a social culture. Yep. Drop down to Marseille where they get a boat, uh, you mm -hmm. know, 
Suez over to, to China. Uh, yeah. And that's the preferred route that Americans tend to take. And so France becomes important, becomes significant. And because of that, a lot of connections form there. And uh, like the herds in particular, try to make the most of their post-bankruptcy lives in France. So Augustin gets a job uh, sort of work managing a, a metallurgical foundry in Bayonne. Uh, his family spends a lot of time living in Biarritz. Uh, yeah. Albert Heard uh, sort of operates out of Paris while he's trying to sort of sell guns to the uh, the, the Russians where uh, as, his, as his marriage sort of falls apart. So it's like, it's just, it, it remains this sort of um, this anchor of their society. Um, yeah. And it's interesting. It's we, I don't have those maps necessarily in the um in the in the book, but if you do a degree map of where they've traveled to, Paris gets the most touch points. It appears as the most oh. significant node in their their travels. Oh. Wow, hmm. everyone's their own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's fascinating, but yeah, especially right. You have these Bostonians who work primarily in Hong Kong, and then Paris is the place that they left to spend time in. That's yeah, they're they're That's global very, minded. They they're global, yeah. They're absolutely global. It's, uh, it's well. the, and that's I think kind of like when you think of it, like sometimes we think of like the nineteenth century people, like so insular, right? It's my little community, and so much work is written in that kind of narrow gauge of like community study, and it's just that that tiny little world, but. All those people in that tiny little world think about the world. They they know and hear about things in Hong Kong and South America and Europe. And they're thinking about like what's the impact of those events on us, right? Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's not... Well, and this was, I think, at its heart, one of the reasons I wanted to do the maps in the first place. And it's informed another mapping project that I'm now working on to sort of a, a greater degree is that when, so I've taught global history for a few years now, uh, and in teaching global history, I find one of the hardest things to get students to grasp is that people were so mobile in the 19th century, far more mobile than we give them credit for. And yes. that mobility meant something different when journeys took as long as they did. Yeah. And so these maps are a way of sort of impressing upon students the extent to which people were actually moving around and spending mm -hmm. time in foreign places. And so, yeah, I mean, that's when I, wrote my Atlantic history book in the 19th century. That was one of the things that I really kind of found the most interesting. And that's why I personalized so much because it was like mm -hmm. these individuals who go from one point to the other and like touch three or four continents in the Atlantic region. And it's not just one, but it's dozens of people. It's, it's immigrants that come to one place and then go back home again after a few years or go somewhere else. And it's, yeah, that, that must be a wonderful project to kind of highlight to students just like that mobility we have in that period. It's yeah, I think it's important. I think it because it also shapes the way that we understand, you know, I mean, if we're talking about networking in particular, it shapes the way that we understand things like networking. Like why do the herds yeah. have so many global networks? Because it took them so long to get anywhere in the first place. Right. So like, if you're three months on a boat, you're gonna yeah. talk to everyone on that boat and then they're gonna go yeah. off in their own separate ways, right? So, yeah. And you write letters to them in a few years yeah. and connect with them again and you cross paths again at some point, right? And yeah. I mean, it's not like a flight today where you desperately hope that the person in the window seat doesn't say anything to you. Like it's like it's far more, far more social by nature. <laughs> yeah. Or you get the screaming kid next to you, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's it, it is a very different world. Oh that sounds like a great project. Right. It's yeah, it's been fun to do. It's it's been tabled a bit because it's uh, it's a big data collection project, so it needs funding, <laughs> as, as these things do. But right, well, it's uh, it's always a challenge. The money, yeah. But we'll keep chipping away at it because I think, especially with some of the changes they're making in digital humanities uh, nowadays, and some of the things we can do with like artificial intelligence and OCR oh. and whatnot, it's becoming possible to do some really cool things with archival sources. Um, oh, I bet, yeah. No, of course. Well, once that materializes more, I'd love to have you back and talk about it more. Yeah, it would sounds love like to, a yeah. great, great project. Or if HNet can be of any assistance, that would be. Oh, I'm sure it will. Be. To... I mean, we work closely with uh, some some friends working on a project called uh, Elites Networks and Power in Modern China, so ENP. Mm -hmm. 
uh, they're based out of Aix Marseille and they work religiously with HNet to crowdsource information. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's proven cool. itself already to be a great resource. Yeah, of course. And we're a digital platform. So we have journals, we have places where we can host maps, we have everything. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's great. No, wonderful. But yeah, I think we should draw to a close here tonight or today yeah. or whichever it is at this point, <laughs> wherever people are listening from. So it was a great pleasure tonight, today to hear about your project, Tom, and your book. And um, for everyone again, I'm this time going to get it right. So this was about Tom Larkin's book, The China Firm, American Elites and the Making of British Colonial Society with sort of a focus on Hong Kong, China, and the herd company in in the region trading. So fascinating book, especially if you want to know a little bit more about China during the middle decades of the 19th century. And again, Tom, thank you so much for taking the time. This no, thank you. I morning really... in your case. Yeah, no, I appreciate it.